Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm Father Chris O'Connor from the Great Diocese of Brooklyn. And uh, this year, just not to many of us, we still have a very large presence here. Right, Frank? There you go. So. <laughs> it started good. That was good. There you go. Okay. So, Holy Week last year. You know Holy Week last year? You don't want another one like that, right? I was in my office writing a letter to the parish, and I was sitting there. I heard an ambulance. Now, that might not seem unusual, especially in New York City. I mean, we hear sirens all the time. Actually, it's weird we don't hear the sirens. But it sounded louder than usual, and I have a severe hearing loss. I'm completely deaf in my left ear. And so for me to hear the sirens was kind of loud. And then I heard another ambulance and was loud. And I started realizing part of it maybe because there was no traffic, because New York City, the city that never sleeps, was pretty much dead at this moment. Nothing was happening. And then I'm typing the letter, I hear another ambulance, and it's loud. And then another one. And they stopped typing. Lord, have mercy on them. What's going on? Lord, help us. And I found out later that the reason why the sirens sounded louder to me was that New York City did not have enough ambulances to take all the COVID patients to the hospitals. We had ambulances come from out of state. And in New York City, our sirens only use 100 watts, but the ones from out of state were using 200 watts. And the reason why I heard the ambulances so loudly is because less than a mile away from my parish was Elmhurst Hospital, which was the epicenter of the entire country for COVID at that moment. They ran out of beds. And then the messages started coming. Father, can you go to the cemetery? Because we have no funerals. We have no wake services. So I go to a, a cemetery, which is not one of ours, and they get there, and the funeral director texts me and says, they don't want you to get out of the car. They want you to do the prayers from inside the car. What? How am I going to pray for these people inside the car? Do you want me to bless the coffin from inside my car? Because what the heck with that? I got out of the car, but they had the coffin like in the middle of the driveway of the cemetery. And the family was in their car watching me. And the cemetery workers are dressed in practically hazmat suits. Because this is the very beginning. No one ruined what was going on. And I went, I just shrugged at the family, who had my hands and heart said, sorry, and just blessed the body and got in the car. A couple of days later, my funeral home close by me says, Father, we have two. Can you go with us to St. John's Cemetery? One brand by my diocese. That's sure. We go, and we get there. And so I go, and guys, it was awful because there was a new section, that cemetery. It looked like France in World War I. It was like trenches because in New York City at that moment, there was a two-week waiting list to get buried, three-week waiting list to get cremated. In New York City, on average, before COVID, 110 people died a day. At the height of COVID, 580 people were dying every day. If you wanted to get buried in New York City, you had to wait two, three weeks. Funeral homes were actually telling people we couldn't take you anymore. So there I am at the cemetery, and I bury my parishioners, and they're going to follow, we're going to go back and pick up the next one. Can you wait? Sure. So I'm waiting, and there's this other family sitting there, and they're crying. And they come up to me, and I know what they're going to ask me. And they say, Father, we have nobody to pray with us. Can you pray with us? Absolutely. So I go there, and I, so I did three burials that day. And then I got to the point, though, like, because they were so backlogged, like, I could go to the cemetery and wait two hours to do the five-minute service. So the funeral home and I, we talked and said, we're going to do, which is not a good term to use in New York City, but we did drive-bys, where they would text me, Father, we're on the way. I'll be in the church, ready, vested. The hearse would pull up in front of the church, I'd ring the funeral bells, and then I would go out. And the funeral director opened the back of the hearse, pulled the coffin out a little bit. The family would gather six feet distance. Everyone's wearing a mask. I go to the family and I just apologize that we couldn't do a funeral mass. My heart really hurt for them because my own father, my grandparents, friends, we had the wakes. We can mourn, we could cry, we can laugh, we could tell stories. The funeral mass, like nobody does funerals, nobody does death, death better than Catholics. 
I mean, our funeral masses bring such healing for the family, but also for the soul of the deceased. And I told him, I'm sorry we can't do this, but once we can have mass again, let me know we could do a memorial mass. And so then I would do the burial rite in front of my church. And sometimes it was like, okay, Father, our next one's coming. And then there's this young lady from my last parish text me, Father, I just found my dad dead, and I can't see him. Her parents were separated. His cousin went to pick him up to go to work. He wouldn't answer the door. He was fine the night before. And he's dead. So this poor girl couldn't see her dad one last time. They did a direct cremation. And she closed me up. What am I going to do? I didn't know what to do. I went to the Lord. What do you want me to do, Lord? He goes, use Zoom. What? Zoom? I never used Zoom before at that moment. I had heard about it. We started using it with CCD. So I went online, looked in on it. So I told Tatiana, I said, Tatiana, I said, I'm going to do a Zoom service for your family. So I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to send a link. We're going to do that. So then I sent the link. And her parents were from Ecuador. So then we did it. I was in my bus sacrament chapel in the rectory. I had some nuns staying with me. We were musicians. And I did a prayer service on Zoom. I did a wake service. And we had people from Ecuador watching it, people from California, people from New York. We had over 50 people in this Zoom week service. And as I said, I was so sorry. This is all I could do. And the sister sang some music, and we did the wake service. And at the end, I said, you know, if you guys want to say anything about your brother, about your dad, about your friend, now's the time. And they all started sharing stories. And even though we're all sheltering in place at that moment. The Lord brought us all together in that moment. And I share these stories with you because it's been a hard year for all of us. And we're trying to figure out what to do to be with our people, to reach out to them, to love them, let them know they're not forgotten, even though the doors are closed, we couldn't have mass, we couldn't have confessions, sacraments. But the Lord took care of me in a certain way because before COVID, I heard about that book, A Consecrated St. Joseph, right? So I pre-ordered that on Amazon. I couldn't wait. I was going to do it. I was going to consecrate myself on March 19th, 2020. But then Amazon could never deliver the book. So after Christmas, I'm getting worried. I'm looking. It's still not available. It's still not available because I want to get it so I could do it in time. And I didn't get it in time to do the consecration March 19th. Eventually, I had to cancel Amazon. I ordered directly from the Marian Semecha Conception. Then I got it. But the Lord knew what he was doing. Because I had to start that consecration in the middle of COVID and make my consecration on May 1st, Joseph the Worker. And every day, for those 33 days or so, I was praying with St. Joseph. And St. Joseph has been a great example to me because he's a confirmation saint name and so forth. But he had to handle such crazy situations. I mean, he had his whole life planned out. He was married to the most beautiful girl in Nazareth. They got a bunch of kids, maybe expand the carpentry business. And then, boom, Mary comes and says, Joseph, I got to tell you something. Turned his world upside down. And then they got to go to Bethlehem, right, for the census. And they go there. He thinks, I'm going back to my ancestral home. This would be great. We're probably going to have some great reception and all that. And they get there, and he can't find anything. And they got to go to the stable. And then they go to the temple, and this is a great moment, presenting the Lord. And Simeon says, and you, a sword of sorrow is going to pierce your heart. And Joseph's probably like, what the heck is going on, God? And then they get back. And then the angel comes and says, oh, by the way, Herod wants to kill the, the mother and the child, Tango of the Egypt. And his whole life is transformed again. Like that guy went through so much problems. And so many things, a life-changing events in that short period of nine months. So how did St. Joseph handle all of that? He had the real presence of Jesus. He was the first human being to see the face of Jesus. When he was born, he saw him first, and then he came to Mary. And then you can imagine St. Joseph, when he's freaking out, where he's worried, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough. What am I going to do? He's had to look at the Christ child and find that peace. He had constant adoration going on. 
he had the Lord. So, like, imagine. And, of course, he went to Our Lady. And that's what we're supposed to do as priests, right? We're supposed to go to Our Lady. We're supposed to go to, the, to Jesus, truly present to us. One of the great gifts of my diocese is our two last bishops most virtually mandated, we highly encouraged that every rectory have a blessed sacrament chapel. And my two pastors, my first decision, each assignment was like, okay, we're right three church, wait, wait, I'm going to find where is the chapel going if you don't have one already. Because it was during COVID, though, I would go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know. Lord, I'm so tired. Lord, I can't figure this out anymore. What do you want me to do? And he was like, just stay here. And guys, I love doing holy hours. I love spending time for the blessed sacrament. But sometimes I'd be in the chapel, and I go in my room, and I realize I've been there for two hours. Sometimes I realize I was there for three hours. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because, like, that's what got me through. I couldn't see my friends. I couldn't hug my mom for six months. I couldn't go out with my buddies. I couldn't see a lot of my parishioners. So I just went to him, like Joseph. And then I was able to make that consecration of me first, and it was just so powerful. It was so helpful. Because then I was like, just like, go, just like Joseph, go see Jesus. Go look at Jesus. You can imagine just growing up in, in Nazareth, right, in Egypt and Nazareth, and how Joseph would struggle. And then he would just look at Jesus sleeping. And he would just remember God trusted him. God trusted him with Jesus. And guys, especially the priest, God trusted us with his son too. Like in our hands, we get to hold God. And sometimes we say mass so often, we might sometimes forget the mystery that we're doing. But celebrate mass, to go to adoration. Like if you wanted to hurt me more than anything else, take away my faculties. You want to destroy my heart, destroy my soul, tell me I can't say Mass. But Joseph just helped me rem remind myself, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Sometimes you don't have to talk. Just look at the face of Jesus. So go to Joseph and have him help you see the Eucharistic face of Jesus. If you remember nothing else from this homily, go to Joseph and help you see the Eucharistic face of Jesus. Because great things happen before the Blessed Sacrament. Right? I don't pray the same way every time. Sometimes I listen to music. Sometimes I listen to Bob's music. Sometimes I listen to other music. Sometimes I put a YouTube video on to help me or something like that. Sometimes I just read something. Sometimes I read scripture. Sometimes I just sit there and look at them. And then the Lord does interesting things before the Blessed Sacrament, does he not? Like sometimes I'm praying, and then somebody I've not thought about in months will come to mind. And I'm praying. I'm like, why am I thinking about Monica? Why am I thinking about Monica? Why am I thinking about Monica? Why does Monica come on? So I, I'll take my phone out. I'll text Monica. i say, hey, I'm with Jesus right now. I'm praying for you. And usually the reply comes back, how did you know something was wrong with me? How did you know I was hurting right now? I said, I didn't know anything. The Lord does. He loves you. Send over a text to someone, a friend of mine, Dominique. I'm praying for you right now for Jesus. He's put you in my heart. How do you know? I'm really struggling with work. I'm pulling my hair out of my head. How do you know? I didn't know anything. The Lord did. So the Lord, the, the Lord wants us to go and know him in the Blessed Sacrament. And Sister Miriam's been quoting from Father Jacques Jalif, and I want to do the same thing in his new book on, on priestly fatherhood. It's also at the feet of the Blessed Sacrament in daily faithfulness to the moments of Eucharistic adoration, that a priest truly becomes a father. Truly becomes a father. This is where the Father of Heaven communicates his true fatherhood, his compassion, and his tenderness for all his children. This is where, in a large part, one acquires the attention for others that one needs. So in front of the Blessed Sacrament, you're truly learning how to be fathers. Because we bring our children, our spiritual children, we pray for them, we love them. We pray and we love them like St. Joseph loved baby Jesus, and the child Jesus, and the teenage Jesus, and the young man Jesus. We love them that way. And I know what I'm saying is nothing new. And I know it's, not, it's been thousands of books written on this. 
But guys, sometimes it's so simple. Just go to Jesus. So I invite you now, just imagine St. Joseph leading you and pointing to you to where he got his strength, to the face of Jesus.